great to be back here with all of you. Thank you, Mike, for preaching for me last week. Uh, it was actually kind of a really neat thing that we did that um, I didn't have. Normally, when I have someone preaching for me, it's because I took the week off, right? And so sometimes people just assume I'm on vacation. No, what I do a lot of the times when I have one of our elders or a guest speaker, you know, come and preach is it gives me opportunity to get all that backlog of work done <laughs> that doesn't always get done when kind of I've always got to get ready for a Sunday morning. So thank you, Mike, for helping to alleviate my week a little bit uh, on that. And um, this week, I want to talk about um, an interesting topic, and it's, it might sound a little strange at the beginning, but um, just, just track with me <laughs> for a moment as we go through this text together. We're getting towards the end of the book of Acts. And so for the last couple of months, we've been doing this sermon series called Church on the Go, and we've been looking at what does it mean to be followers of Jesus in the culture that we live in? Because it's very easy to be driven by church tradition. It's really easy to be driven by our feelings. It's really easy to be driven by what culture says the church should be doing. And not that any of those things are necessarily bad things, but we want to be men, women, boys, and girls that are actually living lives according to what the Bible has to say. How does God want the church to act in crazy seasons of life that we find ourselves in? And so today we're going to be spending some time in Acts chapter 18. If you have a Bible with you, you can follow along in there, Acts chapter 18. If you use on a mobile device, if you use the Uversion Bible app, um, there's a feature in there called Events. And you can find Greenbelt on there. And every week you'll get the outline there with all the scriptures that we go through. You can take notes there as well. And thank you so much, George, for putting that together for us every single week. I really appreciate that. And so as we're turning there to Acts chapter 18, I want to ask you a question. This is a question that was really, really resonating with me over the past few weeks. And this will be kind of, this will be some good cleansing of our soul together this morning as we just kind of confess this together. Um, have you ever felt like, or maybe are you feeling this way now, that Everything depends on you. Have you ever felt that way? Whether it's in your family, have you ever, let's, let's, just, let's just really confess to one another. Have you ever looked at your spouse? Don't make eye contact right now. But have you ever felt this with your spouse that they just don't do enough around here? I know Danielle feels that way weekly, okay? And there's this frustration that creeps into our hearts. If I don't do this, it's not going to get done. Any of you ever felt that in your family? How about at work? That if you don't do this, all these other no good, lazy, good for nothing people who are drawing these ginormous paychecks. And if I don't do it, it's not going to get done. Have you ever felt that way before? Okay, a few hands going up. And if you're on church online, put it in the chat that you're resonating with this. I remember back in my computer consulting days, um, we were working on a project that in the contract that we had put together with the city of Montreal, it was a contract with them, that for every week that we were late on delivering the contract, we had to pay out tens of thousands of dollars in fees and, and, and fines for not making the deadline of this contract that we agreed with the city of Montreal. And, um, and so we were way behind schedule. It was not working. We're, our company is dishing out tens of thousands of dollars each and every week. And I'm the project lead on this with a team of about eight people. And I'm punching in no word of a lie. Danielle was pregnant at the time with Samantha. And I was punching in 60 to 70 hours a week because if no one else would do it. I'm the only one who can. 
These people taking two-hour lunch breaks and going home to their wife and playing with their children and all of these things. And I'm just getting angrier and angrier and angrier. (laughs) You see, it's very, very natural for us in our humanness to get angry at people around us when we don't feel they're pulling their their weight, whether it's in our marriage, whether it's in our family, whether it's with your siblings, (laughs) whether it's at your job. We can just get so angry at people when we see how hard we're working and we don't see them working as hard as we think they should. Now, here's where it gets really challenging for us when it comes to being a church on the go. How often can that attitude that we have towards people, how easily, if it can easily creep creep into your heart in marriage and at work, maybe it's just as easy to creep into the life of the church. (laughs) Well, if I don't do this ministry, no one else will. Or if I sign up for this ministry, I'm going to have to commit my entire soul to this. But I'm going to be stuck doing it for the next 15 years because no one else will help. Or what if, you know, this or that and all of these things. Or when you're trying to reach people who are far from Jesus, it feels like we're doing it completely and totally alone. (laughs) That no one is helping us. Or when it comes to discipling our kids, I'm completely alone in this. Or when it comes to just living out this faith faith thing in Jesus, it can become so frustrating (laughs) if we don't watch our hearts. And so that's what the text, I think, today does for us. We're going to be looking at a very frustrating situation that the Apostle Paul finds himself in. See, the book of Acts begins with Jesus giving the mission to followers of Jesus that you are going to be my witnesses, right? You're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And the beginning parts of the book of Acts, it's this wonderful Christian kumbaya experience. Thousands and thousands of people are becoming Christians. The power of the Holy Spirit is showing up and the apostles are healing people. They're raising the dead. They're doing all these incredible things. They have great favor with the people of Jerusalem. It's just like the best of the best when you think of ministry and when you think of kind of church life. Like they're living the dream. Every church wants to experience those early chapters from the book of Acts. But then about halfway through and right up to the end, it's a dramatic shift in tone where it goes from this beautiful thing and all of these amazing things that God is doing to suddenly we start seeing the pain and the sacrifice that the disciples are called to in following Jesus. Because Jesus didn't always promise a life that's perfect. Jesus just promised his presence. Jesus never promised that you would get everything that you want every single time you ask for it. Jesus just promised that he will never abandon you nor forsake you. That his power will be with you always to the very end of the age. And so we start seeing the life of the apostles taking this turn of them being beaten and mocked and ridiculed and arrested. And so this is where the apostle Paul finds himself in Acts chapter 18. It's been tough on him. It's been hard work trying to bring this message of Jesus everywhere that he goes. And so let's read here from Acts chapter 18. I'm going to start reading here in verse 5. And please apologize. I apologize in advance. I forgot my glasses at home this morning. Good thing I got my big print Bible here. We should be okay. (laughs) Let's read this here. Acts chapter 15. I'm going to start reading in verse 5. So it says, When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia... Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. Now, I just want to stop here for a quick moment. If you remember the story of Paul's conversion 
and Paul being, uh, Jesus coming into Paul's life and, and giving him kind of this call on his life. And then Jesus talking about Paul to, the, to other disciples of Jesus, Jesus made it very clear that, that Paul was going to be this apostle to the Gentiles, that, that he was going to suffer for the sake of bringing the good news of Jesus to non-Jewish people to Romans, to Greeks, to people from Asia, people from Africa, that he was going to be speaking and preaching to non-Jewish people. So here it's kind of fascinating that we're, what we see Paul doing is Paul devoted himself exclusively to the preaching, testifying to the Jews. He's trying to reach his people, you see, there's this huge passion for him to reach his family, his tribe, the people that he knows, the people that he loves, the people that he's grown up with. He wants to desperately see them know who Jesus is as the Messiah. And then it continues in verse six. It says, you know, but when they opposed Paul and became abusive, his people... Not foreigners, not strangers, the people who follow his religion, who follow his traditions, who know who he is, the people that his heart cries out for. They oppose him. They're abusive. And then finally, it says here in the second part of the verse, it says, he shook out his clothes with protests. And he said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I kind of wonder how angry he is in this verse. I think sometimes we, when we read verses like this, we try to soften them. We try to make them kind of Christian, you know, <laughs> that we don't want to kind of really express the emotion, the real emotion that's going on here. I kind of picture Paul after being abused and rejected by his people of probably thinking of these people the exact same ways I thought of these junior programmers back on that project in Montreal. <laughs> you no good, lazy, good for nothing. Your blood be on your own head. If you lose your job over this, I don't care anymore. That's your problem, not mine. <laughs> if you're separated from God for all of eternity, I don't care. It's on you. Blood be on you. Like there's this emotional honesty here that we see in Paul's tone. He goes, I'm innocent of it. And then he finally says, from now on, I'll go to the Gentiles. <laughs> That's what God's asked me to do anyways. Maybe I should do what God actually asked me to do. <laughs> and then it continues in verse seven. It says, then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house, the house of Titus Justus, a worshiper of God. Cyprus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. And so Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. While Galileo was a, a proconsul of Achaia, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul and brought him to the place of judgment. They're still coming after him. It was this man, they charged, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. And just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to them, if you Jews are making a complaint about some misdemeanor or a serious crime, it'd be reason it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names and your own law, settle the matter among yourself. I will not be judge of such things. And so he drove them off. And then the crowd there turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue leader, and they beat him in front of the proconsul, and Galileo showed no concern whatsoever. It's like, it's, like things are falling apart here in Acts chapter 8. 
You see, the city of Corinth is an incredibly powerful and influential city back in Paul's days. Um, It was very powerful uh, when it came to religion. There were a lot of big businesses in Corinth when it came to religion. A lot of the Roman temples were there. There was a lot of money to be made there. There's a lot of political unrest, which is going on here as well. In this season, when Paul is here trying to tell people about this good news of Jesus, you know, the text tells us that Paul was here for a year and a half. That's 18 months. Just think of your last 18 months and everything that we've gone through here in our families and in our workplaces over the last 18 months of this pandemic, right? It's not been easy. It's been quite challenging in so many ways. And so Paul is in this this turmoil time here. See, one of the things that's going on that's not directly in the text, and we can learn about this from Roman history when you study it, is um, a Claudius, who was one of, the, one of the Roman leaders here in Corinth, actually expelled all the Jewish people from the city of Corinth in about 49 AD because they were just driving these people away. Because there were so many fights going on among the Jewish people. And what history shows us is a lot of this fight that was coming up among the Jewish people in the city of Corinth was because of this new movement called the way. Where Jewish people were were becoming followers of Jesus. They were receiving the Holy Spirit in power began speaking in tongues. They they began being able to do miracles. They began taking care of the poor. They began doing all those amazing things that we learned about in the early parts of the book of Acts. And it's upsetting people like crazy. So much so that the politicians have got to stop this and drive them out saying, you guys need to sort out your junk. (laughs) And that's what this politician here does here. When they come to this leader here and they, they, they want him to judge Paul. And he's like, this is a religious thing. Why are you dragging me into this? You see, there creates all this tension and all of this frustration that's happening here. It's a season for Paul of high stress. And I think if we were honest... As Christians, we are going through a season of high stress of being a follower of Christ in our culture today. I was just listening last night to um, a talk from a guy named Ed Stetzer. Uh, This past week, we had our fellowships national convention and uh, Ed Stetzer was supposed to be the guest speaker, but because it, and he was going to do like two days of teaching on culture and the Christian influence in our culture today. But because of COVID, the conference stayed online. So instead of preaching and teaching us for two days, he spoke for 20 minutes. And you can actually get that talk on the fellowship website if you want to check it out for yourself. It's a powerful, powerful 20 minutes to open our eyes as followers of Jesus of the cultural change that we have gone through over the last 18 months. I mean, let alone the the pandemic, but the political shift that we're seeing south of the border that, you know, when we kind of say as Canadians isn't impacting us, oh boy, it's impacting us. Really impacting us up here. Um, you know, all of the tensions that we've been dealing with as a society since the George Floyd murder and Black Lives Matter and all of that and race reconciliation, all the stuff that we're learning about the residential schools from the First Nation people and graves upon graves upon graves of, of children and how that impacts us. There's all these huge tension things coming at us and hitting us as followers of Jesus. And again, and that's just tip of the iceberg. Let's talk gender. Let's talk gender identity, the trans movement, what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman in our culture today. We as followers of Jesus are getting walloped 
on so many topics that we have to so watch our heart (laughs) because we can respond in a way that makes us feel like, man, it's all on me. I have to fix all these dumb people. I got to correct everyone. I got to take this all on myself and just get very, very, very frustrated. (laughs) Or we can learn from Paul's example in this text. Paul does some things in here which are so incredibly subtle because he's not the main guy of this text, but we see how he responds to the world around him. And so the big idea that I want to give you today is in no matter what you're dealing with, whether it's personally in your family, whether it's in your career, whether it's in your education, whatever you are dealing with and wherever frustration is coming from, I want you to remember You are not in this work alone. You are, God is not calling you to do this alone. He's not calling you to fix your marriage alone. He's not calling you to fix your business alone. He's not calling you to be the hands and feet of Jesus in the world alone. Okay. And so let's look at a few things here from this text that I think is really amazing when we study what Paul does here. So the first thing that we see Paul do is we see Paul give space for God to show up. We see Paul give space for God to show up. So we can see, we can see this here in Acts chapter 18, verses 6 and 7. Again, we saw how Paul, you know, he's being abused by the Jewish people. He wants to bring the good news of Jesus, that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus came to die for their sins, to set the captives free, all those good things. And people are not responding to it. Paul, in his frustration, he kind of does hear what Jesus told his disciples to do. When Jesus told his disciples, when you go into a town and you proclaim the good news and people don't accept you and don't want to believe you, what did Paul tell them to do? Uh, So what did Jesus tell them to do? He told them to dust off your feet. I'm falling over here. like, whoa, work on my balance. Here we go. Dust off your feet. (laughs) Dust it off. Why do we do that? (laughs) So it doesn't get in here. (laughs) You so the junk here that you pick up when you're walking and going, you need to let it go. You need to let it go. And you need to give space for God to work. God has not called you to solve the pandemic. You are free in Jesus' name. Okay? God has not called you to um, figure out Vaccine passports, let it go. (laughs) There are so many things that are driving us crazy as Christians right now. We need to give God space. Look at what happens here when Paul does this. Paul does this. He goes, forget it. I'm done. I give up. It's not my responsibility. Blood be on your own hands. (laughs) He's frustrated, but he lets it go. And then the very next verse, actually verse seven and verse eight, it says, Paul left the synagogue. He's done being frustrated with these people. And then verse eight, Cyprus, the synagogue leader and his entire household believed in the Lord. I find that fascinating. I literally have goosebumps just thinking about that. When Paul finally surrenders and gives space to God, the next verse is now here's this religious leader who's just accepted Jesus. We need to give space for God to work. You see, you're not doing it alone. God is with you, helping you. Right? We need to give God space in, in, our, in our work. We need to give God space in our marriages. We need to give God space to work on our hearts so that we don't develop this attitude like everything depends on us. <laughs> this past week, Danielle and I, uh, we were really blessed um, out of the blue uh, with an opportunity to just go on a leader's retreat. 
Um, this was a retreat that was intentionally put together for Christian leaders to just spend some time with God. And they actually called it to reset. <laughs> and, and, and it was just amazing to just spend three days and a couple of, you know, and a few nights just in God's presence <laughs> to give God space. <laughs> now I realize I'm probably spoiled rotten and you're looking at me going, I don't have three days to give up and meet with God. And I sympathize, but you got to find 10 minutes. You've got to, your heart depends on it to find 10 minutes a day to give God space so that he can speak to you, that he could just show up. And you'll actually find you actually have more time than you think you have. <laughs> All the episodes of, you know, Castle on Netflix <laughs> that we watch every night. I don't have to watch four episodes a night. <laughs> Create space for God to show up. Because again, when Paul does this, God moves. <laughs> it doesn't all depend on you. God is helping you if we give him space. The second thing that we see Paul do here from this text, and it's a great reminder for me personally, so I hope this is a good reminder for you, it's to be patient in a rushed culture. To be patient in a rushed culture. Right? Paul was in Corinth for a year and a half. It says 18 months that Paul is here, just slowly teaching people the word of God teaching them about his Jewish heritage, the teachings of the, of the, of, of the Old Testament, of the, the Pentateuch, the teachings of Moses, the, the, the prophets, the law, all of these things. Paul is just slowly teaching this in order to help people come and know who Jesus is. He takes his time. See, I don't know about you, but I'm terrible at taking my time. <laughs> I, I, I want it fixed now, right? Like whenever I see a problem, uh, I want it fixed now. I, I don't want it to take a year and a half to fix it. I, I just want to like roll up my sleeves. I want to get to work. I want to like forget that God's got work to do on it, that I'm just going to get it done. I'm just going to fix this. This is actually how I do kind of um, marriage counseling as well. If you ever come to me for marriage counseling, like I just want to fix your marriage. Just like, just fix it. Just, just, just get it done. You know, like roll up your sleeve, just get to work. Like, you know, and then why would you want to talk about my feelings? No, 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 just get it done. <laughs> right? I could be so rushed. But we need to be patient in this rushed culture that we live in. You know, when there's problems, when there's tensions, when there's frustrations, they might not be solved by Friday. <laughs> even though there's a great book series to how to get a new spouse by Friday, how to have a new teenager by Friday, how to have a new career by Friday, how to hear from the Lord by Friday, all of these books. <laughs> what if we don't get it by Friday? <laughs> what if it takes a year and a half? What if it takes a little bit longer? We need to be patient, right? So this is what we see happening here um, in, in verse 11, right? Just Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half just teaching them the word of God. And this comes right after hearing from Jesus. Like Jesus came to Paul in a vision at night saying, don't worry, don't be afraid. Just keep speaking. Don't be silent. I'm with you. And he says, no one's going to attack or harm you. But then you go further down and you see that he's attacked and harmed. <laughs> what Jesus is talking about is spiritually <laughs> No one can hurt your spirit. No one can steal your soul because you belong to the Lord. We might face trials. We might face temptations. We might face hardship, but it is well with your soul that God loves you so much that Jesus died for you. And that when you turned from your sin and you turned to Jesus for that forgiveness of sin, that you became his and you become sealed with the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit and nothing can take that away. 
no enemy, no persecution, no frustration will ever remove that from you. That's when Jesus says that nothing is going to harm you. But even though in a few verses later, we see Paul being harmed, it's a spiritual vision at play here. And then we are patient with God in whatever we're dealing with because of his incredible love for us. Again, in this uh, talk that Ed Stetzer gave to all of our fellowship leaders this week, um, he, he flat out said, as Christians, we need to develop resilience. <laughs> because we have gone through a massive cultural shift that has changed so much. And it's not going back. So we need to figure out resilience. <laughs> And the best way to experience resilience in the church is to remember that you're not doing this alone. <laughs> we are here walking with you as a church family. God, in his wisdom, gives us one another <laughs> to pray for each other, to encourage one another, to laugh together, to cry together, to serve together, to trust the Lord together. And we can do that knowing that God has our back. <laughs> that we can trust him in this crazy, crazy se season that we're living in. So you're not doing this alone. You're not doing this work alone. God is with you. <laughs> we're with you. And then finally, the last thing, and this probably is my favorite point in this text here from Acts chapter 18, is in your life, whatever you're dealing with, expect a mess. Just expect a mess. Prepare for the mess, but don't cause the mess. <laughs> Prepare for a mess. Just don't be the one causing it. <laughs> but this is, again, what we see Paul doing. It's so subtle, like that he, like in verse uh, 14 here, Right? It's like, so Paul is now, he's being uh, attacked again. They, they've arrested him again. They're bringing him before the leadership uh, of Corinth again. And, 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 the, and they accuse him uh, of breaking their Jewish law, of causing all the problems. All the problems of Corinth are all on Paul's back. And then it says this, just as Paul was about to speak, Paul's about to go. We don't know what he's about to say because God stops him from talking. Everyone else talks instead, <laughs> right? I think there's something really, really powerful in this reminder that um, there's going to be a mess. <laughs> there's going to be complicated things to deal with, messy topics to figure out <laughs> as we're living out our faith in our families, in our workplaces, in our schools, in this culture, <laughs> And you're going to be dragged into some kind of crazy mess one day. And just as you're about to speak, stop. Stop. Let them cause the mess <laughs> instead of us causing the mess. Like I've been trying and I've been counseling a lot of Christian leaders over the last you know, year and a half where we as Christian leaders were like, well, I have to defend the integrity of the word of God. I have to proclaim truth. Yeah, but you're doing it in a way that's actually breaking other commandments from the Bible. Titus chapter two in the qualifications of a church leader. It actually says non-Christians think well of you. So how do you defend truth in a way that non-Christians still think well of you? That's a challenge. <laughs> and we need to figure it out. Because if you're just out there preaching truth and every non-Christian hates you, not qualified to be a pastor, according to the Bible, right? So expect a mess. <laughs> expect a mess. But just look at Paul here. Don't cause the mess. Paul just lets these people duke it all out and figure it out on their own. And again, while this is all going on, then we hear of more people coming to know Jesus. 
while the non-Christians are fighting. (laughs) I heard a story once from a pastor who shared he used to do evangelism, street evangelism in bars. And so he would go into all these different bars in a really bad part of town and try to bring people to Jesus. And, uh, and this is a true story. I'm not making this one up, okay? And, and one night, he was just so incredibly frustrated and mad at these people. And this one guy was drunk. He was like, God doesn't love me, and God will never accept me. And he was just fed up. And he said, yeah, you're right. God doesn't love you. And he stormed out of the bar. And then this drunk man followed him. What do you mean God doesn't love me? God, God, God could love me. And, 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 he, and then he just wrote it a little bit longer. No, you're right. God can't love you. He said, no, but, 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 I, but Jesus died for me, right? He's like, yeah. And, 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 all, and the Bible says all I need to do is just turn from that sin and turn to him and I could be forgiven no matter what I've done, right? And the pastor was like, yeah. And so this drunk guy outside of a bar led himself to the Lord. <laughs> okay? Again, when we step out of the way, when we trust that God's at work, <laughs> When we know God is at work, when we know that God has given us each other to deal with this stuff, sometimes we just need to let non-Christians duke it out on their own. Let them cause the mess. And then we just show up and bring love and mercy and grace and pick up those pieces. And then we see a much greater response. It's very similar to how Paul experienced it here. When we're not the ones causing the mess, but we're there to help clean up the mess. Because that's what Jesus came to do, right? Jesus came to clean up our mess. Before you knew Jesus, you were a mess. I was a mess. And Jesus showed up into our lives and started by cleaning up the mess that you and I created. And then he's in that business of still doing that. When temptation comes, when frustration comes, when sin creeps into our hearts and we let the mess back in, we trust that God is still at work. We trust that God is bringing people into our lives to help us out and that Jesus is still working on the mess. And that's where it's so crucial to remember, no matter what you're dealing with, that you're not working on it alone. You're not working on it alone. God is with you. We are with you. We just need to trust God that he wants to do more than we could ever ask or imagine. Let's just pray together. Father God, as I've been reflecting on this text over the last few days, um, I've asked myself a lot of questions (laughs) God, am I giving you space to work? Or am I, <laughs> am I doing this pastoring thing? Am I doing this Christian thing? Just doing it as if it all depends on me. <laughs> and if I have, God, forgive me. God, if we have been doing this Greenbelt Church thing, like it all depends on us, forgive us, Lord. And so, God, we give you space to work in our lives, whether it's in a marriage, whether it's in a broken relationship, whether it's in our jobs, whether it's at school, wherever, God, you want to work, we're going to trust you and we're going to give you space to do so. Father God, I pray that you would also bring people into our lives to come alongside us and help us and walk with us in whatever we're dealing with. And God, I pray that you would use us to come alongside and walk with people to bless them. (laughs) And Father God, I also pray um, that we know the culture and the world that we live in today is messy. But God, I pray that you would use us as followers of Jesus to help clean up the mess (laughs) and not be the ones to cause it. And God, if we have been the ones to cause it, if we have stirred up fights and tension and strife, forgive us. Forgive me. And Father God, use us to draw more people to Jesus. And just right where you are right now, there might be some of you here today, uh, whether here in person or at Greenbelt Online, who would say you've never actually allowed Jesus to clean up the mess in your life. 
And that can happen real easily right where you are today. Just by quietly praying in your seat or at home, just pray, Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Come into me and make me new. And if you pray that prayer today, I believe what the Bible teaches us, that Jesus has just showed up and he has just made you new. That he has dealt with the mess. And now he wants to bring you on a journey with the rest of us of bringing that hope to the rest of the world. Knowing we're not doing this alone. That we're all in this together. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.